Hi everyone, my name is Bethany Larson and I'm with Larson Evaluation and Design LLC. You can read more about me and my services and find some other things in my portfolio at www.bethanylarson.com. All right, today we're just going to spend a few minutes telling you about a new tool that I've developed for simply and effectively communicating and explaining a, a complex situation that you might be in. So maybe you're a marketing team and you're describing a particular audience segment, or maybe you're a foundation who's working in a collective impact scenario, or maybe you're uh, an evaluator who is doing some developmental evaluation or some cluster evaluation of projects that are really trying to understand where their best leverage points are in their given context. So there are lots of ways to describe something, and a lot of them involve visual thinking. So I would encourage you to check out some of our visual thinking gurus, including stephanieevergreen.com and danrome.com. Today, I'm going to channel a little bit of Dan Rome as we do some hand drawing and vivid thinking to help come up with some really simple and effective alternatives to more complicated and I would say less effective ways of understanding and picturing our, our complex situations. Okay, so you're going to have to channel a little bit of your inner five-year-old, get out your pens and pencils, enjoy some drawings, some stick figures, metaphors, and simple stories so that they're easy to grasp for anyone, no matter how complex the situation is. All right, so what is a system story and how does it differ from some of the other options you might have for describing a situation? So... A lot of times when we have a lot of different pieces, moving parts, we might resort to our flow charts, okay? So our flow charts have these boxes and arrows and they describe some of the activities that we might do and the choices we might have to make along the way and how those things might turn out, right? But these flow charts really only work very well when it's a really simple um, situation where you can look at the diagram and pretty easily grasp what's going on, where the leverage points are, the big choice points, like here's one, and uh, how, um, where some of the places of uncertainty, where values lie, etc. Now, what I often see though are, um, especially in the world of complex project management or programming um, and these logic models that have so many boxes and arrows that we can no longer tell uh, where the leverage points are for the program, what's important for us to pay attention to, and especially if there are alternative pathways and feedbacks in these complex dynamic systems, uh, those are really hard to picture in box and arrow flow charts or logic models, right? So, and what's definitely missing here are the dynamics of how it unfolds over time, some of the contextual pieces that this system actually doesn't exist on its own, but it's in its context. And uh, we're having a hard time picturing what are some of the assumptions here, where are um, our values. And of course, we could use different colors to try to annotate these different boxes, maybe show where there's some uncertainty or put a little star here because there's an assumption there. But pretty quickly, right, we're, we're cluttering this diagram that is already cluttered. So it's no longer an effective communication tool for us. It might be true. It might be our best guess at how the program actually works. But it's a starting place for wrapping our heads around it, but not an ending place, I would argue, because it's just not an effective communication and learning tool. So what are our, what are our other options? So the human brain is actually hardwired to understand the world through the lens of story, right? We think in terms of protagonists, antagonists. We think in terms of a plot line with a climax and a resolution. We think in terms of values of what's right and what's wrong. And we impose these stories even on things that we try to abstract, like our flowcharts, right? If I actually try to think about how the flowchart is working, I automatically insert the characters of the program staff or my participants and the context that's floating around and that might actually influence how the flowchart plays out. So instead of just making those things implicit, why don't we make them explicit and actually part of the story we're using to describe our program? That way, we can talk about what our assumptions are, what our values are, how the context is influencing what we're doing, where the points of uncertainty are, and how the dynamics play out over time. 
All right, so a system story is actually really simple. You are born with the equipment and the mental space to be able to do this. You have two digital devices, as Linda Berry likes to say, attached to your hands. Uh, they're they're power they're what they're wireless. You get to have two of them. They're free, and uh, they can draw for you. And in combination with um, your narrative thinking brain come up with a really simple and effective system story. So I'll use an example that I had from a program I was working with recently and we'll walk you through how to um, start your system story and then kind of let it unfold and have a life of its own. All right. So as you listen to this story, make sure you're watching out for the three to five key variables that are driving this complex system. As a rule of thumb that we often see in complex adaptive systems, three to five key variables. So the metaphor that you're developing, the metaphor that's sticking in your head, guarantee that the reason that it's so compelling to you is because it contains the nugget, those three to five key variables that are driving your situation. Here we go. So once upon a rather recent time, there was a program in the state of Wisconsin that sailed about on the sea of sustainability. Each sailor captain his own ship, each specialist seeking to maximize his or her impact in the regions of Recycling Markets Bay and Pollution Prevention Island. Each captain's goal was to hit as many targets as possible, helping sustainability move forward in the state of Wisconsin. It required great cunning to predict where the boats were going to be, but as long as each ship remained fully stocked, fully supplied, and each captain remained responsive and alert, they succeeded in reaching many of their targets. But then one day, about 10 years ago, a horrible storm arose that threatened to create a whirlpool and suck the entire fleet under as their funding was cut off and destroyed. Their connection to the sustainability trading company itself was severed and the elements threatened to overtake them. And so each ship scattered to it the four winds on the sea of sustainability, trying to find funding, trying to find shelter, and itself then adapting and becoming a new program along the way. Since then, the fleet remains connected and very loosely uh, tied together as they still are stocked and supplied by the sustainability trading company, but the fleet is now spread apart and in fact most captains don't even know what the other captains are doing. And overall, the broad range, um, the broad area that the ships are covering is so broad that it can hardly be defined anymore. And the head captain of their division at the, at the sustainability trading company is wondering if his fleet has become vulnerable or if the fleet is missing targets that are now in between their boats that they can't see because they're so far apart. And so has come to the big question of what if another storm were to arise or what if other threats were to come through the sea of sustainability and pick off boats one by one or they become so spread apart that they miss some of the biggest targets that are out there and become unviable and no longer needed and obsolete in the state of Wisconsin. All right. That's our system story, and it's for a real-life program that at first seemed pretty simple, but as I dug into the situation, began to understand um, some of the really unique, context-specific um, historical path dependencies, we might say, with that big loss of funding about 10 years ago, um, unique people, the personal factors of these um, particular solo captains and the cultural norms that they developed around sailing alone. Um, we began to wonder 
gosh, what is driving these other boats out there? Um, it, it began to give us a rich array of all kinds of evaluation questions, like what is the probability of another storm happening? Or which part of the sea are we actually sailing on and which part of the sea should we be sailing on? Um, always wanting to keep an eye out for what we're how we're impacting others and asking, have we caused collateral damage? So in the end, we're hoping to decide, is there even a better way for us to be hitting these targets than to be sailing as five separate ships? Or uh, maybe there is a, there's a hybrid model that we could pursue. So we set up this cast of characters in a setting with protagonists, antagonists, um, huge sources of uncertainty, dynamics that play out over time, uh, path dependency, assumptions that we had to make, and values about which targets, for instance, are better to go after, what ways of sealing are, are good and which ways are bad. Um, so this system story started with a key metaphor that kind of just fell out of an interview that I did with one of the staff early on, right? And this is because we all think metaphorically. We're all thinking in terms of story all the time. And so this metaphor of um, five solo captains sailing about the sea of sustainability uh, just kind of fell out naturally because it was a very apt way to describe a very complex situation in a very succinct and powerful picture. So starting with the picture then, we ran with it and we built um, the storyline, a plot line about it, um, past things that had happened and future questions that uh, we were facing. And this is where um, it's really cool that it's not just a story written down in a book, but it's a story that you're living and that you don't know what the end's gonna be. And it is still a, a bit of choose your own adventure. So the next step after you developed this key picture and populated it with a cast of characters, with a plot line, with a great noble goal and some barriers to getting there, potential climax and resolution, um, maybe several possible climaxes and resolutions, um, all you've got to do then is write it down. So draw a key picture or two from that story and jot down a few sentences. Simply start with a once upon a time and a the end could be just as short as one paragraph, could be longer, right? If you wanna describe the, the many decades that have um, gone before this program to kind of set it up on its path for where it is now. Maybe you want to play out a couple of scenarios into the future. Um, and maybe you want to list at the end some of those sort of choose your own adventure questions um, that we especially find useful as we're planning programs or we're evaluating programs. Questions like, are there better targets to hit? Um, What's the probability of another storm coming? Should we be sailing a different way or in a different part of the sea? Um, the great thing about these stories is that they picture, they're really good at picturing things that flowcharts are really bad at picturing, right? So stories picture people and their roles in particular times and places. Um, these stories capture context, which is really hard to draw when you're drawing a flow chart and how those uh, particular features of the context might influence the situation. You're gonna capture moments and points of uncertainty, right? As you try to unfold the plot line, you're gonna come to points where you wonder, hmm, I don't know what's gonna happen here, or I don't know why that did happen then. And those are points of uncertainty, and your story helps you find them and make them explicit. As you move the plot line forward, you then have to make explicit assumptions about how those uncertainties will play out. And most importantly, especially for evaluators, but really anyone who's doing um, good work out there in the world, is understanding the values that you are seeing and striving for in your story, in your situation, right? So we can't develop stories unless there's a good guy and a bad guy, unless there's a right answer and a wrong answer, right action, wrong action, good outcomes, bad outcomes. Those are the things that are all value judgments 
that really drive evaluation questions and that drive um, social entrepreneurship and other decisions that we make as companies, as coalitions, um, and even as individuals. So I encourage you to try this. Let me know how it goes. Send me an email at bethany at bethanylarson.com. Make sure you check out my website to see that actual example from our program. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.